This is the Dr. Chris Radio Horror Program at 91.3 FM, WCUW in Worcester, Massachusetts. And if you're not listening to us live on 91.3 FM, you can hopefully catch this on our Radio Horror YouTube and Vidme page. And joining me uh, in the studio is my friend and temporary co-host Cordelia. Hi there. Thank you for uh, joining me, Cordelia. You were on with us a couple years ago, and we had Jack Ketchum, New York Times best-selling horror author, on the show. Mm-hmm. Yes, and Cordelia is joining me for another amazing horror author, a uh, Stoker Award-winning author, Nancy Collins. Thank you for coming on the show with us, Nancy. No problem. No problem. And and, and Jack or, or Dallas is, is Dallas. Is Dallas. Yes. <laughs> uh, he's an old old pal of mine as well. That's awesome. Yeah, he he lets us call us he lets us call him uh, Dallas as well. But for professional <laughs> uh, courtesy, we do address him as Jack Ketchum. I've been reading Jack Ketchum about as long as I've been reading uh, your stuff. As a matter of fact, yeah, we we are contemporaries. We we pretty much hit the hit the ground running within a year or so of each other. In the in the eighties, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, late eighties, late eighties, yeah. Uh, is that when he released? Um, the Girl Next Door? That was the first one, right? Girl Next Door. I don't think Girl Next Door was his first. No. No, that was in the, that that was like in the early 90s. Oh, okay. If and I remember then, correctly. Yeah, and Sunglasses was uh, oh. 1989? 80, 89, yeah. yeah. I, I, um, I, I, that was Sunglasses After Dark was one of the first vampire books that I can remember in recording in my brain of seeing on a bookshelf and going, what is that? What is this female (laughs) vampire on this cover? I had only been exposed to a couple of female vampires before, but I think it's Sunglasses After Dark's main character that really has driven me to always want to write about female vampires more than male vampires. Uh, Yeah, well, Sunglasses After Dark uh, benefited from uh, a rather uh, unique... Uh, cover design, um, I, and I was I was basically the randomly chosen nobody uh, for them to test market this concept because at the time all the horror novels that were coming out either they were black with embossed covers or had skeletons on them, and Sunglasses After Dark was all white, completely white. The artist Mel Odom, who's uh, I'm still in contact with through Facebook. Uh, he went on to he, he he actually won a cover design for that for sunglasses I believe, and um, uh, he was doing covers for uh, for Playboy, We, uh, Blue Boy, uh, Out Magazine, um, and he later went on to design a, a, a very successful fashion doll. Uh, I cannot remember the name of her for the for the life of me, but she's still you know she's a very successful you know. Uh, what they call a glamour fashion doll for people who collect those kind of things. Oh, he did the cover for Tempter too, as I recall. Yeah, did Tempter yeah. and uh, the cover for um, uh, In the Blood. Right. I, I have all three of those still. The the ones that I got in the eighties and nineties. But uh, but yeah, he uh, Mel's an incredibly talented uh, author who looks like his models. <laughs> 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 even even now. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're none of us are as young as we used to be, but Mel still well, Mel still holds up. And um, uh, but it was completely white. The the, the first edition had no type. Uh, there was no title on it. My name wasn't on it. it was the the uh, the image the, the image of uh, the female vampire's face with uh, sunglasses sliding down her nose and just a hint of fang and. Um, that did exceptionally well for us, and uh, so the second edition, the cu- my name and the name of the book and the fact that it had won a couple of awards got slapped on the front. So that's how you can tell the first of the s- and the following editions from from one another. The, uh, the first editions, the ones with no type, are worth twenty five, thirty five dollars a piece. Now, when Sunglasses After Dark was adapted into comic books, did you get a lot of say in like how the 
uh, how the main character was going to be depicted because a lot of the covers have them depict have her depicted as any kind of comic book female with like very tiny waist and exceptionally large breasts and <laughs> things like well, that. Well, yeah, I, I did have some say because I wrote it. <laughs> uh, um, and, you didn't just sign and, your rights away. <laughs> you got to understand, I was working with Glenn Danzig. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, Glenn Danzig okay. was the publisher. Oh. I didn't realize he was the publisher. Oh, yeah. I, I had no idea. Wow. Yeah, Glenn's a fan of mine. Yeah, he's a, he's a big horror he horror fan, and he was a big fan of Sunglasses After Dark, and and, and a comic book fan, obviously. And when he uh, launched his Verotic uh, publications back in the mid '90s, he approached me about doing a comic book adaptation of Sunglasses After Dark. And I actually, at, at that time, I was still working for DC and doing Verotic, uh, do, uh, doing Vertigo, the Vertigo uh, Swamp Thing. And uh, basically, he wanted to bring in someone uh, who could bring in that Vertigo audience. So the Sunglasses After Dark series was kind of meant as a stepping stone. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, however, I was not aware that all the other books in the Verotic um, uh, in the Verotic stable were going to be hardcore pornography. <laughs> <laughs> I was not aware of that. <laughs> I'm not uh, familiar with these comics. I must hunt them down. <laughs> oh yeah, they're that was, he, well. The, he he had he had he spared no expense. Frazetta did stuff for him. I had I actually had a Frazetta cover on 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 one of comic I did for him. Um, Bisley, uh, Simon Bisley, uh, Martin Eamon, the rest of Soul. Um, uh, all kind, yeah. He 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 spared no expense in, in terms of uh, of the art and all that. And um, uh, it, but I ended up with uh, I picked uh, I actually picked the artist I had. Or, or no, wait. He, he no. Stan was assigned to me. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but Stan and I actually through early through through facts, you know, the old school facts, the thermo facts. He and I sent sent uh, worked on the character design. Although I didn't really have much say about the about the covers, and and to, to the to a great extent, I don't really have that much to do about any argument about the covers. I mean, this was during the time of the bad girl cr- craze in mm-hmm. comics, mm-hmm. so the fact that her breasts were not the size of her head um, is is a win. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, she yeah she was uh, she's dressed a bit skimpier than she than she's described of it in the novels, but um, she's actually physically if you if you go into the comic book she's actually physically built the way I describe her, which is more like a dancer or an acrobat mm-hmm. than um, than a stripper. <laughs> but then you have like and, some of the covers like the fan club editions, which show, oh yeah which well, show, the, like, well those were and, yeah and basically and yeah, Glenn uh, commissioned hair. those. And 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 they were and and I know for a couple of them that they'd never ever seen the comics. Um, uh, my my favorite cover artist was Martin Eamond, who did the first, second, and the sixth covers. And he actually he really Martin really Marty really loved Sonya. He really loved that character and he really understood her, and uh, and it shows. In, in the artwork that he did, and I'd, I'd say my second second uh, uh, my second favorite was J- the Jason Pearson's uh, um, covers, at least for um, uh, the third and the fourth. I'm not a big fan of the fifth one, um, yeah. but um, and and I don't really know the Japanese artists that that were put on to the uh, fan club editions. I've only seen one fan club edition. Yeah, we see it here on uh, online as well. They're they're mm-hmm. pretty anime tastic, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, you you just have to gotta go with that. <laughs> <laughs> if I got upset over how characters were portrayed by artists, uh, I wouldn't be. I would never have worked in in the comics to begin with. Yeah, uh, and I look at it. It's a collaborative thing, basically. Uh, I'm always fascinated by how uh, other people interpret my work. Um, I'm always fascinated to see how how the artists um, interpret it, or how um, vocal artists, or or, mu- or film versions, or, or audio versions come out. Because I'm I'm always I find that 
find it fascinating to see, you know, I mean, we put this in and this comes out the other end and I'm kind of find that the thought process that goes behind that rather fascinating. It is kind of unusual um, that, you know, a character like this, uh, especially today where everyone is really trying to um, adapt something um, to uh, cater to a growing, larger and larger growing female uh, fan base of strong female characters. Like we have like Atomic Blonde coming out with Charlize Theron and such. Mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, this hasn't been like brought into like the mainstream media more uh, for well, people to do something with it. I know you have well, like a script or well, something. Well, I've been poked with a stick repeatedly uh, by Hollywood uh, with her. So, um, and in fact, I've been kind of poked a couple of times in the last six months. So I, I'm not in, in any position to say anything, but um, don't be, don't counter out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we came really close. We came really close in the early 2000s. In, in 2002, um, uh, Palomar Pictures uh, had optioned it, uh, had optioned Sunglasses After Dark and, and the character of Sonny Blue. And we had... Um, had a screenwriter and Catherine Bigelow was probably she was going to be doing Ooh. you know going to be the director on it oh, wow. and um, uh, however this all hinged on Palomar's big tentpole film of that year which was K-19 The Widowmaker um, wow. which cost $350 million and I think made $80 million mm. worldwide yikes and and basically sank the sank the the studio. Uh, and, I mean, it was a feel it was a feel good film about a bunch of Russians in a in a submarine in a nuclear submarine stuck on the bottom of the ocean that was leaking radiation. Based on a true yeah, you know, it was a true story and all that. And it, it yeah, it was it was not it was not going to pack them into the theaters. I can tell you that. <laughs> 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 but uh, it had Harrison Ford and Liam Neeson in it, mm. and um, and basically, when you if you ever watch it, just look at that and think, you know, the you know, that's why you didn't get to see Sunglasses After Dark or Sonya Blue on on the big screen in the, in the early two thousands. I guess we'll cross our fingers for future developments. <laughs> yeah, it always hinges on something, you know, you, something else that you have no way of, uh, of knowing about or counting on. Yeah, I mean, uh, I guarantee. I mean, Atomic Blonde was already in development uh, long before this, but I will lay down money right now that there are more. So many studios, including Warner Brothers, waiting to see what the tickets on Wonder Woman are going to be before another female-led film is greenlit. Yeah. Well, I mean, well, at least one with a huge budget. Yeah, Ghostbusters last well, year was a huge disaster for Sony. I mean, it was critically panned. It didn't make back its it, what it cost to make the movie. And it's just kind of a bonkers film all around. I'm not going to get into the review of Ghostbusters. But Wonder Woman, completely different. 76-year-old, longest-running uh, female comic book character in history... You know the pinnacle of feminism and just ideology and good and righteousness. All our hopes are waiting on you. <laughs> Honestly, yeah. get us out from under Wonder Woman. Yes, yeah. exactly. I mean, literally, <laughs> the theme song from Linda Carter's show couldn't resonate more today with any movie that Hollywood is just sitting there going, "We'll see how it goes, and then we'll send this blacklist script off, or they'll greenlight the." The siren, Gotham Sirens, or whatever. I mean, there's a whole bunch of comic book movies. But speaking of comics, Cordelia had a uh, wanted to talk about Swamp Thing. Yeah, I was curious about your run on Swamp Thing. Um, what drew you to that project? Well, what drew me to that project was being uh, solicited for it. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was basically they um, uh, they were at a position. They were at a point where. Uh, the sales on Swamp Thing were so bad that uh, back then, back then, if your sales dropped below, got to like forty thousand a month, you were on the bubble. And if they dropped below to to below twenty, uh, you were canceled. And it was on the only the only reason that Swamp Thing was not canceled at that point was because there was a, t a, a cable television show. Uh, that was running concurrently, as well as a 
children's tel- uh, children's animated series. Yes. And that was what was keeping Swamp Thing alive at right. the time. And uh, basically, my new editor, uh, 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 they hired a new editor, which was Stuart Moore, uh, to come in and try and and revive the series. And he had been, up until that point, he had been working for at St. Martin's Press, uh, an actual publisher publisher as opposed to a comic book publisher. And he's, he told him, well, I think we need to get actual writers, like horror writers and stuff like that, on this. Um, so let me – I've got this short list of people I want to contact and see if they can, uh, you know, uh, basically audition for it. And I was on that short list because uh, um, a few months before um, – uh, Stuart had been my editor on uh, on an anthology uh, on a uh, I was in called um, that was based on the uh, Nightmare on Elm Street series called Freddy's Sweetest Dreams or Seven Sweetest Dreams or something like that. So it was basically a, I ended up there because of Freddy Krueger, and um, I had written I had written a Freddy Krueger story that Stuart said it Stuart liked it so much because he didn't have to rewrite it. <laughs> that was the biggest he didn't have to he basically he said I only have a couple of th- changes here and here and I went okay and I turned it around within a week and he said okay and uh, so he approached me because he liked the way, I write, the way I was writing and he knew I could meet deadlines r- relatively quickly and um, so he said you're living in Louisiana aren't you and I went yeah how would you like to write Swamp Thing I said do you know Swamp Thing oh yeah I know Swamp Thing I was I, I, I knew it from it was one of my favorites when I was a kid and, and I, I was a huge fan of the Alan Moore run and uh, so he said can you provide us with like uh, an out uh, an outline a detailed outline for a first you know for like the for like an annual because that's how we're going to launch it is through the new series through annual and uh, and then um you know, outline the first the first year, and I, and I managed to do that within a week. And basically, they liked my outline, and they and the fact that I, I included a lot of I, I, you know a lot of uh, I was living in New Orleans at the time. I threw in a lot of local color about a lot of stuff that you know that you know down you know very down south, and um, they liked the idea, and they hired me as the writer. And I so I got a I had a two year contract. After that, and I um, went into writing Swamp Thing, and the first, you know, and, and uh, it's one, it's, it was, it was a dream job, you know, because I also got free health care on top of it. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I didn't. I was, I was thirty, so I didn't think I really needed it, but, but, uh, but I also had health care on top of it because it was a company-owned character, and I worked on that for. Um, for two years, and um, and I and I and I still have an immense fondness for Swamp Thing and and Swampy and his family. And uh, although it is rather painful at times to to realize that everything I did was has been written out of continuity. Yeah, nature of comics, I guess. Yeah, I mean, that yeah, could, that kind of happened. Yeah, with, but uh, but yeah, to 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 a very great extent. I mean, everything. Uh, I'm not even terribly sure how much of what Alan did is still around. Yeah, that's right. Say that because they, um, bef- uh, make a long story short, because there's a lot of continuity. Uh, before the uh, the Flashpoint and the New Fifty Two and the Rebirth or whatever, they brought Swamp Thing back uh, in a storyline called Brightest Little Day, and he was yeah. revealed to be like the White Lantern, and he was actually Alec Holland again. And you got to go read the whole thing. I can't even explain it, but. <laughs> um, they, uh, but there's some pieces of Morris story in place because, like, he, uh, John makes a joke to Swamp Thing in, in the, the Hellblazer Rebirth series currently out right now. You ain't gonna use me again to, uh, knock up your wife like you did last time, Swamp Thing. And he's like, no, not that. Let's talk about something else. Nice touch. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, it, that, that, that's a, I, I, I honestly have no clue what is and isn't, um, uh, uh, part of that anymore, yeah. Because I, I more or less stopped reading. Uh, you know, I more or less stopped reading uh, Swamp Thing uh, after I left. 
<laughs> because it was just like I, I had other things to do. Plus, it's like you know what other people do is what other people do. I did what I did with the character. It's up to other people to do what they do with the character. And um, but I enjoyed um, I had, you know, enjoyed working on on, on the series. And um, it, it it is finally all of it. My entire run is now finally available through Comixology. Cool. Although mm-hmm. there is, to my knowledge, there is no plans for uh, a, a paperback, you know, a trade paperback edition of my run. Yeah, they they're. Uh, I mean, I think it's mostly Marvel because I don't see DC doing a lot of it. But they Marvel's putting out these like omnibuses collections of like tons of issue and recolored, and they're like hefty books for like a hundred bucks, and they contain like tons of issues. So I don't know if DC is doing anything like that. Off the top of my head, I can't uh, that, but... no one's no one has <laughs> has contacted me to that effect. Although they will occasionally hunt me down and have me resign new paperwork, new contractual paperwork, and you know. For, in regards to new technologies and stuff like mm-hmm. that, so who knows? I may have signed something and I have no way of knowing. <laughs> well, my uh, one of my early Swamp things was nominated for an Eisner, which was uh, the one where I had him <laughs> where he he was being run for the governor of Louisiana <laughs> and, and, and almost won. Is that like yeah, Citizen like, Talks? He made the, he made the primaries. <laughs> There's there's some parallels to Citizen Toxie. Yeah, yeah. Um, before uh, we jump into uh, more novels, uh, I, I, I didn't know that you wrote a, Fri- a Nightmare on Elm Street novel. What was the story in the Freddy Krueger's Seven Sweetest Dreams about? Well, I, I didn't write a novel. I wrote a, a, a novelette. A novelette, a uh, short story. Uh, I wrote a story called, I think it's called Not Just a Job. Um, or basically, it's it, Freddy has almost nothing to do with it except he pops up occasionally it's it was mo- modeled largely on the freddy's nightmares tv yes. show um but basically um it's about this uh this guy um who doesn't realize it until freddy starts triggering dream flashbacks for him um that he's the son of a serial killer and and not only was um he the son of a serial killer but his dad used to take him out you know, to show him the the trade mm-hmm. when he was a kid, like when he was six or seven, and it's pretty. Gra- a lot of it's pretty graphic. Um, but pretty yeah, British. but the idea was that his dad was a tow truck driver who would prey on um, young couples that were stuck on the side of the road, and he would take his son along with him. As a Freddy Krueger story should be. Yeah, yeah. Kind of like how graphically. I don't know if you ever read this, but there was a there was a Jason versus Leatherface miniseries by Topps Comics. I yes, saw I that, that as a kid, and I was like, "What the fuck is this?" <laughs> yes, I, I I wrote that. Yeah, I, it was like, "Holy <laughs> crap!" I still have those issues. Um, I was yeah, blown those away those by are that. like forty dollars a piece now. I know, isn't that crazy? Yep, that's I can't f- I can't keep them every time every you know every <laughs> time uh, uh, I I had some and then. Uh, I sold them or I lost them, and and then I had some more, and then you know I had to pay like thirty five bucks a piece to get them. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, going it can't just be about she lives a quiet life and is just really overly interested in her kid. It's got to be you know. Yeah, she waited too long to have a kid. You know? Yeah, <laughs> that, that's what I pulled down to. But I'm not sure that's got enough legs for an entire season. Well, Wildstorm but... <laughs> did a thing. Wildstorm did a thing a few years ago where they said that uh, Jason was cursed. Because, like, the land, Crystal Lake was cursed because the white men came and slaughtered out the Native Americans. Oh, Jesus Christ. And they Christ. use a vessel every few years to enact their revenge, and that vessel was the dead body of Jason Voorhees. Well, this is how you get into the, the sequelitis with the more elaborate backstories for every little thing. And it can't just be that, you know, somebody was a dick and now they're a serial killer. It's got to be the son of a thousand maniacs, and he was born in an Indian burial ground, and he was impregnated by satan or whatever i mean it just well well they have to kind of get around rather rather um the fact that they kind of portrayed someone who was a mental handicapped as a serial killer right yeah (laughs) so that was that that was a bit that was one one of the the elephant in the room for a lot of that um but it, it for the but for the jason versus uh leatherface comics one of the best reviews i ever had in my life, what I'll always treasure is is one that uh, that reviewed 
um, Jason versus Leatherface number one, and and basically came down. This is a this is a lot better than it needs to be, <laughs> <laughs> or has to be. <laughs> and uh, and and the other good uh, what I, what I knew I'd done it, done it right was when um, Gunnar Hansen walked up to me and said, "You wrote that, right?" Yeah, you, you, and he had it with him, and he said, "You you wrote this, right?" And I went, "Yeah." And he goes, "Well, you you got him right. You understood Leatherface." And I went, "Okay, thank you." Well, that's <laughs> and and that's how Gunnar and I became friends. Oh, that's awesome. That's a good. Yeah, that's that's a that's a fantastic sto- that's a fantastic story to uh, to tell people to you know just because of him being the you know the most iconic version of that character, the original. <laughs> yeah, I, and and later years later, I ran into Bill Mosley, and. Um, and he was uh, – this was just before or just after um, Devil's Rejects had come out. Mm. And um, – no, it was, it, it, was, it was before Devil's Rejects – yeah, okay, I can't remember if it was before. Was it, but, I, but I know I definitely know it was after A House of a Thousand Corpses. And um, I introduced myself and I said – you know, told him that I had written Jason versus Leatherface. And he went, oh, you wrote that. And I went – I went, yeah, and he goes, well, we had that on the set. Oh. And, and I went, oh, okay. <laughs> and so that 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 was, you know, we kept that on the set. I went, okay, well, that, that's good. <laughs> um, and so I, you know, I felt like I I managed to 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 make you know make some make some. Uh, you know, contact. You know, when they say when they say in the baseball world, make some contact there. <laughs> and I guess I, I managed to at least get, if not over the fences, I'll at least managed to get it to the outfield. <laughs> so, the uh, your most recent comic book series, uh, Vampirella, I really, really loved, and I thought it was uh, written in such a way that it was like, you know, I was, I was reading a comic book, but it felt more like I was reading a novel. Just because the amount of words like written into it were way more than your average comic book these days, did you do that? And, and I and I scaled that down. Oh, you did. And I scaled <laughs> it down. I I thought I was being rather relatively you know, compared to how my old Swamp Things were, because my Swamp Things could get pretty wordy. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but then again, look who I was like having to follow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> When you're when you're having to follow Alan Moore, anything else seems like you know almost like Hemingway, um, uh, is is telegraphed as Hemingway. But um, but with um, uh, Vampirilla, uh, I thought I was actually uh, dialing it back a bit. Um, uh, but then again, I don't I I haven't been reading a lot of. Uh, a lot of modern comics and the ones I do read are by friends of mine who have the same problems I do <laughs> so uh, and tend to be a little bit more, but, but I was trying to drive it more you know trying to drive it a lot more through dialogue than I would have normally um, and uh, but I but with Vampirella I also had the benefit of having been friends with Archie Goodwin Mm-hmm. It was uh, back when I was at DC. He was he was he was one of my mentors when I was at DC, and um, he and I he and I were, were were good friends. And I kind of feel like when I was working on Vampirella, I had Archie um, watching over my shoulder the whole time. So and I hope I hope it did him proud because he was before, you know because he was actually the he didn't create Vampirella, but he was the one who actually probably was the first decent writer on the series. And actually gave the character a lot of uh, a lot of her history and and um, a lot of her character per se outside of the fact that she's she got boobs and she wears a skimpy outfit. <laughs> yeah, you definitely wrote Vampirella in a way that it was not just. I mean, and she'd been written this way for a while off and on um, beyond being like a teenage joke, and she, you know, you really infused a lot of. Uh, Lore into this into the twelve issues you did, and the, like with the whole like the court of the Nosferatu, and like her taking over and the, being a queen, um, and such. Do you also have like a lot of input on like what she's going to wear to being the writer? Because she's not in her typical normal bathing suit through most of your run. Well, I tried to I tried to uh, during during the last half of the last six months I was there. I kept saying, "Can we redesign her costume?" And they said, "No, no, no," and and. 
because they had tried redesigning it um, when they first when Dynamite first bought the character. Yeah. That was about ten, ten something years ago. When they first re, it re they were going to like redesign the, when they re- relaunched Vampirella. Like um, she was basically wearing a pantsuit. Uh, they went kind of went to the far extreme instead of like her, you know. Uh, they they instead of instead of her wearing the the sling suit that she wears uh, is best known for. They um, they covered her up literally from neck to neck to, to, to toes, and had her in a duster and a, a long sleeve blouse and, and and you know pants and and you know so she she, she was completely unrecognizable in turn in. Ter- in in those terms, except for the fact that they still had her old costume on the covers because after the first couple of covers, they realized that no one was picking them up <laughs> without without her being on in her old suit. So it was kind of weird that they would have her with her old suit on the covers, but you'd pick it up and read the book, and she would be like, you know, just like she was teaching third grade. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and... and, and and it was in, and the fans reacted rather very negatively to that. And so when I uh, took over, uh, I actually had her. Uh, there's a bit where she has has she goes to her closet and she takes out two th- two two hangers, one of which has the the, the duster and the the pantsuit on it. The other one has it has her you know basically her spaghetti strap sling suit there, and she goes. Eh, why fight it? <laughs> <laughs> and puts on her outfit, but but my my take on it was that that outfit is a battle costume. It is not what she should be walking around in twenty four seven. So whenever you see her in my comic, she's either wearing my in my run, she's either wearing a uh, trench coat, you know, a belted trench. Kin- trench coat that she throws off when she has to fight Mm -hmm. or she's wearing honest to god out clothes that when it's time to fight she just tears them up and or throws them off and and she's in her suit and that's basically how i treated that is that it is a battle suit it is not her and and no woman just wears the same thing every day (laughs) no i'm sure red (laughs) sonia has many many versions of chainmail that just hang up in her but I mean, they that question had been asked of Red Sonia too for a while because Red Sonia and Vampirella basically wear the exact same costume. It's like a bikini, it's a bathing suit. Um, you know, it's uh, Red Sonia's uh, excuse for why she wears the way she what she wears. And this is what I think Gail Simone, who wrote Red Sonia for a really long time, ex- I think she was writing it during the time you guys had that big crossover. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know Gail's okay. a friend of mine. So she said that Red Sonia wears that costume because A, it's her slave costume. It's a costume she was a slave in. B, she wears it because men are not going to be intimidated by a woman wearing that costume. So they think they're going to be able to take advantage of her and do things to her when uh, she obviously shows that she's a warrior woman. They're already, oh my god, they're caught off guard. Um, so they're looking at her body and not thinking about she can kick our ass. Um, yeah, so they're too busy looking at her boobs to... Exactly. To, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, I mean, if you can believe that Vampirella got her costume from her mother is... <laughs> I guess Superman got his costume from his mother. Well, her mother's <laughs> basically the whore of Babylon, so it's not really that... Is that the, still uh, the origin? I thought they've changed it again. Is well, that... her, 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 mother is, her mother is Lilith, the first woman. Yes, yes. That, that has been uh, a staple for a while, but whether her mother is good or bad has gone back and forth so many times. No, her mother. Her mother is 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 evil in the sense that she is the essential bad mother. Okay. Um, uh, that that's my interpretation. Is her mother? Uh, you know, basically, her sin was hubris, but she's also a, just an awful mother. Mm-hmm. So, so she's just awful, and and she does have you know she does have plan or did have plans of conquest. My my plan was to bring her back from the dead in my series, but it got canceled before we could do that. Mm-hmm. Um, but Lilith was ba- originally basically she was uh, built you know to be Adam's wife, but she uh, she was made his equal, and she kind of looked at him and went, "Yeah, I don't think so. I could do better." <laughs> And flew off to go and and create a race of supermen as opposed to just humans, and um, and she ended up breeding with a bunch of demons or or uh, 
or fallen angels or whatever you want to call them and yeah. and that's what the and the vampire races that are throughout human history those are her children he each had a different you know, demon father and uh, although it, I reveal in, in, in my run on that the fact that they're all these children are vampires has nothing to do with the fact that their fathers are demons but the fact that that she was cursed by God and her, her his and God's curse on her was that her children will not be superhuman her children will have will be monsters and they will have this weakness and the weakness is they can't go out in the sun whatever whatever it is but they're but they're lesser than humans and greater than humans in many ways but lesser than humans and for her attempt to subvert the will of God and uh, and it's also revealed finally I finally revealed uh, my big I my biggest thing on my run of swamp uh, run of vampirella was I was allowed to finally reveal you know, or at least in my world uh, who vampirella's father was or is and in mine world she, her uh, her father was Cain mm, yes I yeah uh, the Cain. Yeah, from the Bible. <laughs> and it also explains her relationship with her with her twin sister Dracolina, who I also brought back from the Warren run. Um, Dracolina and and Vampirella are identical twins, except for the fact that uh, Dracolina has blonde hair and Dra- and Vampirella has black hair, and they have matching um, uh, vamp- uh, vampire bat shaped birthmarks. But on opposite boobs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to my knowledge, that's the difference between them. and the fact that that Draculina is evil and uh, Vampirella is not. Um, and uh, Draculina is, and the reason for this is that uh, Kane, who is also one of the uh, in in my series, he's still alive. He like 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 Lilith. Um, He's been cursed by God to never die, mm-hmm. and he's still around. hasn't really changed much over the thousands of years physically. Um, and his curse is that all his children will and uh, will end up one will end up killing the other. You know, well, the the curse of Cain. What the curse of Cain and Abel is is so he will get to know the pain that his father and his mother. Adam and Eve knew upon having one child kill the other. Gotcha. Yeah. And and so uh, he's kind of uh, so all his kids are you know, there's when he has kids they're invariably twins, and when he has you know, kids with human women or whatever, they're invariably twins, and one's dark haired and one's blonde uh, light haired, and the light haired always ends up killing the dark haired. Because uh, he's light-haired, and his brother was dark-haired, so um, so I got to bring in th- all, that whole aspect of um, uh, where where Vampirella finally meets her father, and uh, along with as and after being you know, finally being reunited with her evil twin sister, and and it and it's not. And nothing is is and nothing is just um, uh, gi- a given. You get to see uh, uh, Cain isn't evil. I mean, he did an evil thing, but he's long since repented for it. But he's he has he still has to suffer. And Vampirella and Draculina suffer are doubly cursed. They they live under the curse of Lilith and the curse of Cain. And that was also going to get. You know, played out but they canceled it before I could do that. Yeah, <laughs> but they, I did bring her back. I did bring Draculina back. They they redesigned her again and she's got this like Van Helsing looking costume on and she looks like she's a teenager. Um, who, who Dracula no, uh, uh, Draculina or Vampirella? Vampirella. Vampirella they they redid it um yeah, they did that about a year ago. Um, after they, I left, they they rebooted it with I think Kate Leith was yeah, was from writing Squirrel it. Girl, yeah. Yeah. Now and I'm a fan. they re- yeah, they redesigned it, and the design wasn't too bad. The, the costume design wasn't too bad. My, my, I did have a costume design that I tried to that I proposed, but and, and I basically said, look, you know, you can't just you you can't just change it too radically because 
most of your fan base are in their 40s and 50s. The backlash, <laughs> and, yeah. and they are mostly men. The backlash uh, would be severe. Uh, we're, we're trying to bring in... Well, basically, the, the, the reason to redesign the costume was to try and get more young women willing or able to cosplay as Vampirella. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because, because you have to really be A, one, fit, and B... Fearless. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you're basically your entire body is you're 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 basically walking around ninety percent naked. You're almost naked. And you're almost the, but, naked. But yeah. I guess I see it with like Kate Less redesign. You can have um, a woman who's not as skinny as Vampirella wear like a corset to tuck everything in and not have oh, to worry Vampirella's about Oh, Vampirella's not skinny. She's quite suit. voluptuous. Yeah, well, that, I mean, that's the, the boob size or whatever. I've seen different co- models cosplay as Vampirella with varying breast size, but they, you know... Well, it's, one... her, her bra- it's her breast to hip ratio has pretty much been kept uh, pretty much as it was when it was designed by Frank Fazetta. But most of the, so she she got curves. Most of the models, again, they, you know, I've asked them about like, you know, how, you know, what does it take to kind of like wear this costume? Or, you know, where do you find your courage and things like that? And she's like, a glue. lot of squatting and a lot of exercise leading up to putting this costume on to make sure I have a completely flat stomach and they like, you know, the I'm not like hanging out anywhere that I'm going to feel like embarrassed about and so on and so forth. So I feel comfortable in my own skin wearing this costume. Now, with the redesign, you don't, you wouldn't have to worry about that as much just because you're wearing this uh, hot pants. Bike a, pants. Bike yeah, pants. Bike pants. Biker pants. Yeah, and combat boots. And I mean, you can, I guess, a, a big more novice level cosplayer would feel a little more comfortable going out in that and not having to deal with quite so much backlash. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And you could have someone who was who was under who was not 21. Oh doing. yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because then and otherwise you'll have the because uh, otherwise yeah you 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 know the, the the other thing with with, with dressing up Vampirelli you use a lot of glue uh, uh, every every because uh, every time I do conventions I would have people come up with to me dressed as Vampirelli at some point mm-hmm. and they invariably have the costume glued to them um, which is it, which is something that models it. use it's, it's called body glue yeah. And um, uh, one of the best ones is this, uh, was this Afro- African American uh, woman in uh, Virginia, who um, was had a, had a marvelous uh, uh, Vampirella costume, and she looked the part. I mean, she looked. She had the hair and everything. She looked the part. She, you know, uh, she, you know, didn't matter whether she was black or white. She was Vampirella, and. Um, and also, there's a woman here in the Atlanta area, uh, Madeline Brumby, who's a professional actress, uh, does um, you know like low budget direct to video stuff, and she dresses like Vampirella, and she she also has a really good costume, and um, and she uses body glue. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, you have to be willing to 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 let it all hang out, so to speak, if you're dressing as as the classic, you know, original recipe Vampirella. And my design for it would have been pretty much the same costume, in like a, with, except for the fact that the legs would be covered. She, it was, she would have, you know, instead of the legs being bare, she would have like tights, and with with you know boots, uh, because a lot of that that is the fact that so much of the body is bare, mm-hmm. including the legs, and cover up the le- and make sure had the legs covered in tights, put a kind of a belt around the waist. And um, uh, uh, but and and maybe widen that widen the straps a little bit, but but give it that that V plunge all the way to the all the way to the treasure trail, and uh, there you go. Uh, <laughs> that should that should keep every, that should make everyone happy at some point. <laughs> and on that note, <laughs> we uh, we do appreciate you coming on the show with us, Nancy, to talk a little bit about your work and everything else. Um, uh, where are you going to be at any conventions coming up that you'd like to plug? Uh, I'll be at a convention in this coming February in Little Rock called uh, Not Another Comic Con, I believe is, is the name. It's um, I, I'm from Arkansas originally, so this will be the first time I'm, I've actually been invited back to my home state as a professional creator. Oh, that's cool. That's very. Cool. That's the only one that I have on my roster so far. You know, that can change. But if you, if, but if people are interested in my work, you can find it on Comixology. Last year, uh, IDW released the um, the hardcover collected 
uh, Sunglasses After Dark uh, graphic novel, which basically Stan Shaw and I, we had the rights to the original artwork and story. We couldn't afford the film from uh, to buy the film back from Danzig, so basically we went and rescanned, and Stan taught himself digital coloring, and we completely and we never liked the the the, the coloring job that was done on the comic to begin with, but we completely recolored it rewrote it somewhat to make it a little less wordy uh, and make it flow more like a graphic novel than as an illustrated novel. And um, it was re-lettered because the our original letter, Bill Oakley, uh, rest his soul, um, died. Uh, it, and it took 20 years to get this thing back into print. It took us five years just scanning and recoloring and, and rewriting and re-lettering, and it came out uh, – uh, last year through uh, IDW, and it's beautiful. It's a it, the, the, the coloring the coloring palette is far more muted and pastel, and it and it completely changes the feel of the book. It it, it, it is art. Yeah. <laughs> it is a arty vampire female uh, female punk vampire novel, a uh, graphic novel now, and um, I've been I was really happy with that. We'll look for them. Thank you again, okay. Nancy, for uh, coming on the show with us. Give out your Twitter as well. Oh yeah, my t- well, let's see what is my Twitter. <laughs> I, I'm also on Facebook. It's, it's easier for me to remember I'm a, I'm on Facebook than to remember I'm on Twitter. Yep. But it should be it should be Nancy. It should be under Nancy A. Collins. Okay, Nancy A. Collins yep. uh, at uh, at Twitter. I also have a uh, fan page for Nancy A. Collins on Facebook. All right. Again, thank you so much for coming on the show with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. No problem. No problem. Yeah, y'all have a good time. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>